whole non-aggression Once that lesson sets in, you see a session but you Welcome to 3 Count Commentary So we're going to be talking about NXT from February 28th, 2023 uh, a very solid episode of NXT, despite the fact that it had seven matches on it. So, uh, I can tell you this, NXT hit the skits the later in the show it got because again, too much, but this was a very, very, very solid show. There's definitely some stuff on here that they could have shaved and it pro the show probably would have been a better quality show, but Overall, I think they really hit some of the high notes. They did some really cool stuff, and they really set up some things for Roadblock next week. That really would have been, that's going to be fun. All right, let's get into the show. So we start the show with a brawl in the hallway. Everybody, most of the people we haven't seen in forever, are fighting in the hallway. Zion Quinn was in this cramped hallway fighting. Uh, because everyone's trying to rush to get to Wesley, who is standing in the ring for his open challenge for the North American title. Daba Kato bursts through. He's, you know, the biggest, strongest guy on the roster. He's coming towards the ring, and he's attacked from behind by Apollo Crews, who apparently wants to beat up Daba Kato more than he wants to be the uh, North American champion. While they were distracted, Nathan Fraser slid into the ring to get the match. Nathan Fraser has been gone since October. That's how I, he has been gone so long. I forgot he existed mainly, mainly because he was a work rate guy with no character. Guess what? He is work rate guy with no character. These two goes out there and they had a, essentially an indie style match. There was choreographed dance spots in between them, uh, with the eye kick, you duck, I leg sweep, you jump, then I grab you, we roll up, you kick out, then we go into the yada, yada, yada. I was like, oh my God. Those were the frustrating parts of the match. Uh, they also hit a lot of big moves. A superplex from the top rope into a corkscrew net brain buster by Nathan Fraser. It was absolutely absurd. An absurd move. Um, a cool thing that actually happened though is Wesley dies over the top rope. Uh, what was it? Whatever Kenny Omega called it, it was a Tope Con Hero, and he actually landed on his feet because Nathan Fraser moved. Um, now, at least that played into the finish. As Nathan Fraser jumps off the top rope at one point, he misses and hits the announce table. That leaves him open for the attack on Wesley, and Wesley hits a top rope dive, throws him back in the ring, does the handspring kick that they call him the cardiac kick, and... Uh, he wins the match. Um, okay. This was pretty good. Um, the, my issue with this is that Nathan Fraser has been gone since October and you come in, you bring him back in with a loss for starters. You don't do any vignettes to build them up. It was a complete surprise. And so many people are kind of like, who, huh? Where he been? And then it was a short welcome back chant. Very short. Welcome back chant. It wasn't like people were all in. Um, <clears throat> and you know, the guy has nothing going forward. I thought, okay, well, if he, if he wins and he wins the title, then all right, they, we've got a feud here. I thought if he loses, maybe he could turn heel and attack Wesley. And then, you know, you could, could have a feud there, but apparently there is no feud. It's just Nathan Fraser is back and he's back in the exact same position he was in before he left. He does flips and he loses literally like 90% of his roster. He does flips and loses. That's unfortunate. Uh, Wesley is still North American champion. Also unfortunate, very unfortunate, quite unfortunate, upsetting even. All right. Uh, JD McDonough, he's talking up. He was explaining to us a retinal tear and then, uh, says that dragon off will know, or will learn what a retinal tear is like. And that he knows that Dragunov has, he being J.D. McDonough, has, uh, okay, let me pause it, pronouns, pal. J.D. McDonough says that he knows that Ilya Dragunov has a high pain threshold, but he will push him past his limits. Um, and basically, he wants this forever feud to continue because Ilya Dragunov detached his retina. I really, 
I I'm voting for all of these guys. They need to separate some of these people. Like there's just too many of these guys on the roster. Jensen and Briggs, they had multiple segments on the show. I wasn't a fan. Uh, basically it all boils down to this. Jensen is distracted because, uh, the things with Keanu James ain't really working out and it's not working out because of Fallon Henley. Now Fallon Henley has already apologized to all parties, but the thing between Jensen and Keanu James has not been repaired. Briggs starts talking about how men are, are dumb bots when it comes to women. And, but he's doing better than he was six months ago. So they have a match against Indu Sher, in which they lost, of course. But they lost because Jensen was being distracted and missing spots and wasn't really sure of himself. He was kind of screwing up. My favorite thing about this whole match, if I could say I have a favorite thing, is Booker T talking about Indu Sher by saying they don't eat no bread, they don't drink no water, they only want meat. Just meat, which was my second favorite Booker T line of the night. My first favorite Booker T line is when he was ta- calling uh, Nathan Fraser a great white. And he was like, he's swimming with the Makos, <laughs> the Hammerheads. And everybody was like, what is he talking about? Uh, I love that. Especially since, you know, the Seamus, his nickname used to be the great white before people started flipping out about the whole race thing and him being super pale. It was supposed to be a shark type of thing. So that's where Booker T was going with this. Um, I don't, th- I think he actually called him the great white hope too. I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure, but he definitely called him the great white, which is hilarious. All right. So, uh, after Jensen and Briggs lose, they had another segment in which Jensen had to apologize. Um, and said he just wanted to have a do over with Kiana James. He just wanted to make things right. But he doesn't know what to say. He's not. He doesn't have any experience with this stuff. So Briggs volunteered to do it for him. So this is going to be, of course, the next big turn. Is that I'm pretty sure now Briggs is about to find out that uh, Keanu James was up to no good. Or maybe Briggs is going to try to steal his girlfriend. Who knows? Uh, do I really care about uh, this hillbilly soap opera? Not really. Uh, it would be easier for me to get into it if I actually like the people who are in it. But since I don't, um, it's pretty <laughs> pretty frustrating that they, they get multiple spots and other people don't. But at least they got a reason to exist on this show and they, they got something going on. So that's fine. Uh, I, I hate Briggs and Jensen. And I didn't particularly li- like the match with Indu Share. Um, speaking of Indu Share while we're here, Indu Share challenged the Creed Brothers to a six-man tag. By saying, but Jinder Mahal saying that the Creed brothers have conquered every challenge that, that they have put in front of them, with the exception of Indu Share. And next week, they're going to get 10 times the beating as the Indu Share was laying down the challenge. So the Creed brothers had to go and find a third person. Um, they went and they talked to Damon Kemp, who they feuded with, believe it or not. Uh, and Julius Creed you know, swallowed his pride and said that, you know, Damon Kemp is a terrible guy. He's horrible, very bad. But all his terrible qualities is the reason why he would make a useful partner. Damon Kemp just said, hey, are we putting the band back together? Are we putting Diamond Man back together? And Julius was like, yeah, sure. But Damon Kemp was like, nope, don't want to be partners with you. And as they was about to throw hands and get into it, Brian Breaker came over and volunteered to help them because the Creed brothers came and helped him after his championship match against Jinder Mahal last week, uh, which I forgot about, of course. So Brian Breaker and the Creed brothers versus uh, Indu Share with Jinder Mahal. And this is going to kick ass. Brian Breaker and the Creed brothers being partners. Tremendous. That energy. That's that's. Oh, boy. I'm telling you, that's some, that's some special stuff right there. You know, that's meat on the bone right there, brother. That's beat meaty men slapping all over the meat. I like the Creed Brothers. I love Brian Breaker. I love all of these guys. This rules. You know, Iron Sheik put over Jinder Mahal on Twitter. Like, come on. You know, <laughs> there's you can't lose, man. You can't lose. 
But um, I like this. I like the I like the the Brian Breaker Creed brothers. He fits with them like a glove. You know, almost immediately Brian fit in with Brutus as being the the jacked up, the intense jacked up fireball. I mean, this reminded me a lot like of you know being in a locker room. You know, watching a college football team or something like that in the locker room. You know, working themselves up. He's like, oh yeah, this this rules. This rules. This is what this business needs. It needs more Brian Breakers and Creed Brothers. Fewer Wesleys and Nathan Frasers. All right. You know, fewer Jensen's too, because that guy sucks. Uh, yeah, just throw Briggs in there too. He sucks too. Uh, I, I liked him in Evolve, but he sucks in NXT. Sorry, brother. You suck. Um, so that six man tag should be very fun. And, you know, some guys are going to get thrown around because big meaty men are going to be slapping meat. All night long, and, I, and I'm not mad at that. Okay, so uh, they were about to do a medical update on Nathan Fraser. When nope, they had this. They got the camera crew got uh, well distracted by Wendy Chu being down in the parking lot. So Wendy Chu is down, of course, in that vaunted hellscape known as the NXT parking lot. So we got another one down in the parking lot. Uh, Wendy Chu in her jammy jams, you know, beat up by mysterious forces. So backstage, uh, Tiffany Stratton is basically giving everybody sound advice. Don't go in the NXT parking lot. When KC Squared comes out and they say, oh, weren't you in an issue with Wendy Chu? Which is true. Tiffany Stratton did have a feud with Wendy Chu, a long running feud. Tiffany Stratton was offended by this and then said that you guys were suspiciously around when Wendy Chu went down and you guys were in the parking lot when the Keaton Lions went down. How about it couldn't be you? And then she had a, a, a blonde moment by saying that she wanted to be a detective, to which she got cut off and uh, Katana Chance challenged her to a match. I don't know. Okay, sure. Um, look, Wendy Chu being uh, knocked down, I guess, is f fine. Uh, it's just a storyline, I guess. Somebody's doing something, all right. Um, since Nikita Lyons is going to be down for like a year, uh, you need to have somebody who's going to have to wrestle the person who gets busted um, injuring people in the parking lot. So I guess Wendy Chu has to be the one. Because you can't keep this storyline going for a year. Nikita Lyons is going to be down for the next 10 months or whatever. Uh, Katana Chance was defeated by Tiffany Stratton. Of course she was. Uh, why wouldn't she be? Isla Dawn and Alba Fire distracted Katana Chance and Caden Carter. Which uh, led to Katana Chance missing a big spot. And uh, Tiffany Stratton taking over. Getting the pin with the uh, her double triple jump moonsault. After the match, Tiffany Stratton says that she has already proven that she's the best in NXT, but that's not good enough for her. She doesn't want to just be the best. She wants to be the champion. Therefore, she's going to challenge the winner of Mako Satomura and Roxanne Perez at Stand and Deliver. You might as well just give her the belt right now because anything else is uncivilized. Tiffany Stratton is clearly the, the best female wrestler on the roster. Outside of Mako Satomura. I'm talking about complete package. Yes, there are people who are technically better than she is. But as far as having everything that they need, yeah, she's ready. You know, uh, they must just give her the belt now. I mean, it, it is what it is at this point. <laughs> we just count your goddamn days. All right, just count your days. All right, so Gigi Dolan cuts a promo. And it is the damnedest promo. So let's discuss the content before we start talking about the performance of it. Because I want to talk about these two things separately. So Toxic Attraction's theme plays and you think she's the Bret Hart of the team. All of a sudden she's going to get to keep the theme and she says, nope, turn it off. This is going to be the last time we ever hear that theme. And she says that she can handle the physical pain. She's been dealing with abuse her whole life. Um, and... She can deal with her having her head cracked. She can handle that. What she can't handle is the betrayal. She's also done with that, dealt with that too. 
and that they were close, she and JC. And so JC knew how painful this would be for her. And, you know, she's talking about living with her uh, abuse. And we're like, oh, what's this about? You know, this is something. Then she starts talking about uh, toxic attraction, saying that uh, it was fun being the mean girl for a while. But it was always about the superficial, the glitz, the glamour, the fame, which is all J.C. Jane wanted. And she said that herself, she was hiding her inner demons. And one of her inner demons is that she was abused by her mother and she ran away from home and wanted to show her little brother that she could make it as a superstar in WWE. So she's not at all shaken by uh, JC Jane and that instead she's going to put the final nail in toxic attraction. And I have to say, I was not ready. I was not prepared in the least bit for the story that Gigi Dolan laid upon us on this show. I was not ready to hear about how she was being abused by her mom and she ran away from home to be a wrestler. I never, never thought I was going to hear something like that. That was one hell of a babyface promo. That was one hell of a babyface promo. She definitely got more comfortable the longer the promo went on. But, you know, the content of it, the things that she was saying, you know, was it overshadowed her physical performance. Sometimes the physical performance of what you say can overrule what you actually said. In this instance, you're looking at her trying to sort through all of these different things. And she's trying to equate JC Jane attacking her and the betrayal within that to the betrayal of dealing with abuse her entire life. And that's not something that can stop her. You know, she's not, you know, mentally destroyed as one would be, you know, and even the physical pain doesn't bother her as much because she's been through this kind of pain before and she grows in sort of intensity as the promo goes on so even though I wasn't a a big fan of her physical performance I really liked the promo I thought it was amazing and she knocked it out of the park so if I was just you know not in the room and I was just listening to the other out from the other side of the room, I probably would have been like, what did she just say? And, you know, poke my head in like what? As opposed to, you know, she's saying something very intense, but I don't believe it. Um, this was tremendous. And to be quite honest, uh, even though I know on this channel, I've been saying that JC Jane is the star of the team and she should, you know, And I was even thinking that she should probably go over. But now I'm saying, JC, Gigi's got to win, right? You know, Gigi's got to win. So, wow, what a promo. That was tremendous. And they're doing it. They did a great job. They did a great job. So that Gigi Dolan promo was star making. Now, what's her new presentation going to be? That ought to be an interesting piece because it can't be toxic attraction. You know, it seems like there's going to be a thing where they both are going to go their separate ways on toxic attraction. Um, So I don't know, but I'm looking forward to what they're going to do with Gigi. All right. So uh, Chase University, uh, Duke went over to apologize to Thea Hill for being rough on her last week. Um, Then Thea Hill's like, oh, yeah, well, apparently, you know, I'm pretty sure Mr. Chase is going to accept your apology too. And he was like, oh no, I've fully believed everything I said about Chase University. <laughs> so before she could really follow up on that development, we got uh, an interruption from the schism. They hijacked uh, Andre Chase's uh, streaming feed. I, I don't know, man. It's I don't know how they, they how are these guys good with technology where they could just hijack stuff? I don't know. Who, who in the group is the hacker? You know, the, the who, who, is this the AV club? What is this? Anyway, um, Joe Gacy 
Taurus talk about how the university is a failure. The grass is always greener on the other side, and there's plenty of grass on this under the schism's tree. Um, Duke Hudson knows the truth about Chase University, but he won't uh, wave the white flag. And uh, you know, Thea Hale now has felt the warmth and comfort of being with Schism. It's all over her skin. That's why you know she wasn't physically harmed. But she was shown reality, and she can't handle it. Uh, interesting, very interesting. So once that whole thing was over, Andre Chase said he's tired of these guys talking bad about his school and his students and everything, and he's going to fight Joe Gacy next week. And all right, if 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 we must, if we must, I would rather not. I I would rather not. But if we must. Let's just do it and get it out of the way. All right. <laughs> I guess we got to shove something in the middle. I think we should have kicked this match for two weeks and put it on the 14th or whatever. Um, anyway, okay. Anyway, third match on the show. Mako Satomura defeats Zoe Stark. Solid, uh, solid to good match. Um, Zoe Stark is already being groomed for the main roster. She's already working house shows, uh, SmackDown house shows. This is different from working main event because, you know, pretty much uh, NXT talents have been getting called up to do main event matches here and there. Not main event, the TV show uh, for, I think it's some Hulu or something like that that they, WWE does product for. Um, almost any t NXT talent does that. They've been putting uh, Zoe Stark in fatal four-way matches and triple threat matches with Charlotte and uh, Rhea Ripley or Sonya Son Deville or whatever. And uh, they're really grooming her to get to the main roster. They're really fast-tracking this thing. I mean, obviously she was going to lose because Satomura is wrestling Roxanne Perez next week. So clearly she was going to lose for that reason. But now the idea is maybe she's just you know, doing her jobs on her way out. And she's going to get called up after WrestleMania. Um, look, everybody knows Zoe Stark is like somehow the oldest 28-year-old or something like that on, on the planet Earth. I mean, geez, it was like the wall hit her at 12 or something like that. Um, so I'm not surprised Triple H and Sean really like her and they want to call her up, but for, for, cry, for Christ's sake, she's been in NXT all this time and she has no character whatsoever outside of I wrestle good. That's her entire gimmick. I wrestle really good and I can do cool moves. You know, she this is this girl is not going to get over on the main roster. It's not going to work. She's going to need a personality. She's going to need a friend, a tag partner, a prayer, something. She's going to die on the main roster. She might be able to go out there and execute the moves and everything, but when it comes time to cut a promo or something like that, I really question whether it's going to work out. But they may see something I don't, so I'm going to leave that door open. But I think Fast Track and Zoe Stark on NXT is a, is a mistake. But it's Triple H, man. He wants to push his guys and girls, and Zoe Stark's one of them. They love her. Ugh. Mako Satomura and Roxanne Perez have a stare down after the match, you know, because they're going to have their match next week. Interestingly enough, with Tiffany Stratton at Stand and Deliver, I'm guessing it would be smart to keep the belt on Roxanne Perez. And uh, have Roxanne drop the belt to Tiffany Stratton because you're not going to have Mako Satomura lose to Tiffany Stratton, are you? But then again, Roxanne Perez will have to beat Tiffany uh, Mako Satomura. Is that believable? But I don't know. It's wrestling. Who cares, really? You know. All right, moving along. Die Jack said that Tony D'Angelo is public enemy number one. Called him a street rat and said he's going to lock him down for good. For good. All right. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Sol Ruka defeated Electra Lopez with the Soul Snatcher. Valentina Faras was with Electra Lopez. This continues their storyline of Electra Lopez trying her best to corrupt Valentina Faras and try to get her to cheat. She uh, wanted Valentina to give her the brass knuckles, but Valentina wouldn't do it. When she reached for under in between the ropes to try to get the uh, brass knuckles. Uh, Sol Ruka recovered 
and did the Snow Snatcher. So it was actually putting her in position was like the 619. And so Ruka ended up winning the match. Um, so Electra Lopez, after the match, uh, starts shoving Valentina, telling her to give her the brass knuckles next time. She's pie-facing her and everything. So Valentina puts the brass knuckles on and punches Electra Lopez in the face, knocked her out. Okay, so Valentina is not going to be feuding with Electra Lopez rather than them being partners. I, I, I guess this works for me. I guess this is fine. You know, um, Electra Lopez being stuck in NXT. Mm, I see why they did it. She clearly is not ready, but she still should be with. You know, like, come on, there's tons of guys on the main roster that aren't ready. Johnny Gargano's not ready, for Christ's sake. Uh, Soul Ruka, I feel so bad for this poor baby because every every time she does this Soul Snatcher, it's a tremendous looking move. But my God, imagine in 10 years what her back and, and spine is going to be like doing flips off that second rope pretty much every week, multiple times a week. You know, uh, that's what Randy Orton's back problems, you know, jumping up in the air, landing on his back every every night for 20 years. You know, that's on top of the regular body slams and all that kind of stuff you take. She's just, you know, doing an extra flip. She's going to probably have to come up with some kind of different version of that move. And maybe save the actual Soul Snatcher for a, a bigger show. I just, I hope that she is pre- mentally prepared for the damage she's doing to her spine and back doing this move so many times. And she, of course, had to practice it. So now she's got to do the move in real matches. But Soul Rook is actually looking pretty good. You know, she's she's bounced back from you know her early kind of green days. You know, her being very athletic. And now they're leaning into her athleticism. I still want a more solid character for her. Like being the beach bum is not, that ain't going to do it. We supposed to be trying to make superstars here, not just push wrestlers and put wrestlers on TV. For Christ's sake, Triple H, Sean, you guys know what works. Just do what works, man. Put some tassels on somebody or something. Put some color on these people or something. For Christ's sake. All right, Gallus was shooting pool again. Uh... Mark Coffey was whispering in Wolfgang's ear about the horrible things that Pretty Deadly did to them and how Wolfgang should be mad about it. And he was mad about all these things. And then some guy nudged him as they were playing pool and Wolfgang beat him up. They want to beat up Pretty Deadly. Of course they do. Pretty Deadly is hilarious. Now, they go to a backstage promo about Pretty Deadly and they are being absolutely silly. Uh, The blonde one, whose name I forget, He's wearing a pink shirt, but wearing brown overalls. It is ridiculous what he's wearing. But they are absolutely hilarious as they continue to make fun of Gallus. And then they mock Scotland (laughs) because because reasons. And, um, well, because Drew McIntyre uh, is trying to help put over Gallus. So, <laughs> pretty deadly in mock Scotland because all the Scottish guys are working together. Uh, then they started giving out high fives, and of course, pretty deadly are not going to high five the microphone holding female reporter because why would they? All right. Uh, I don't. Did we talk about Hank Walker yet? Uh, do we need to? Okay. Hank Walker got into was in the was in the middle of the brawl in the hallway. He kicked Axiom in the face by a mistake. Axiom got upset with him. He said, oh, you could have killed me with a kick to the face, even though we were all fighting in the hallway. You kicking me is a big problem. Um, in any event, Axiom wanted to have a match with Hank Walker and kind of provoked the match by saying Hank Walker wouldn't have beat, wouldn't have beat Wesley anyway. So Hank Walker was like, what? I wouldn't have won. I wouldn't have won. And the shoving match continues and he got the match. This could have been completely left off this show. It was unnecessary. Axiom defeats Hank Walker. Who cares? Axiom then gave Hank Walker some modicum of respect post-match by saying that he's uh, he's really good or something like that. This is stupid. I know it's continuing the Hank Walker story, but we could have not done this. We didn't need anything that involved Hank Walker and Axiom on this show. We didn't need it. Grayson Waller. 
is very excited. Shawn Michaels accepted his uh, desire to come on the Grayson Waller effect. But he says, what Shawn Michaels are we going to get? We're going to get the heartbreak kid or are we going to get the corporate stooge? And he says that it doesn't matter to him as long as he gets shown his proper respect. Grayson Waller is very good. I think a lot of people are now pitching ideas of who uh, Grayson Waller's opponent is going to be. I know Don Tony is really set on it being Johnny Gargano, which would make sense. So especially if Johnny Gargano is not going to have a WrestleMania match. We're just going to put him on NXT Stand and Deliver. Uh, some other people are saying it's going to end up being either uh, Eddie Thorpe, which I think is Carl Fredericks um, from New Japan, or it's going to end up being uh, Dragon Lee under some kind of WWE name. Um, I actually like the Johnny Gargano idea, and I think it might end up being Johnny Gargano, but, you know, we won't we won't know for sure, but Sean is going to have some fun with Grayson Waller next week. Um, also fun, Carmelo Hayes defeats Tyler Bate. Just a set up, straight up main event. Nothing special coming coming out of it. It was pretty simple. These two guys were fairly evenly matched. Uh, each one could do what the other one could do. Uh, the big mistake comes with Trick Williams getting on the apron. Tyler Bate takes. Of course, his distraction. He tries to do a big spinny thing from the top rope. He missed. Carmelo Hayes did the top rope leg drop and wins. Uh, I'm also very concerned about the tailbone of Carmelo Hayes jumping off that top rope a bunch of times per week. It's probably not smart. But uh, overall, solid enough show. Uh, I definitely could have gotten rid of the, the, the Briggs and Jensen match. And um, gotten rid of the Axiom Hank Walker match and just sort of extended some of the other stuff that was going on or maybe added some more segments. But um, overall, it was a really good show leading into Roadblock, which should bang next week. That should be very good. So, you know, hey, they they finally starting to pick things up. They're starting to try to find the right mixture of character and in-ring stuff. And... Uh, well, outside of maybe a couple of boring guys here and there, like Axiom and Hank Walker, they're doing something positive. They got some boring shit next week, too. Um, but mostly, the, the card is pretty stacked. We need more stuff like they did with Gigi Dolan. That kind of stuff needs to happen more often. You know, you can't just come up with people being abused every week, but we need people speaking from the heart, being given that time and that ability every week. And uh, Tiffany Stratton, I'm definitely ready for her to be the champion. So, I liked it. I thought this episode of NXT was very solid. What say you? Do all the YouTube things, guys. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out. Bongo Slate. Best house ever, you daddy. <laughs>